Hi there, I'm Moon from Mo One Drama and this is Moon Interviews. Today my guest is Emina Ashman and uh, she is in Melbourne, Australia. She's an actor and a playwright and her creative expression contours around acting, poetry, embodied movement and performance art. Hello, Emina. Hi. <laughs> You're originally a Malaysian who has moved to Melbourne and you've been studying there. You went to, where was it that you, you studied acting? So I studied acting at the Victorian College of the Arts and it's part of Melbourne University in the heart of Melbourne. And I went there when, when was it? 2012. So I've been here for about eight years now. And you found work opportunities as an actress in Melbourne? Yeah, and you know, I'd say that it's that ebb and flow, isn't it? Sometimes you get work, sometimes you don't. And I think that happens everywhere, no matter where you are. I've been very fortunate that I've done a play a year, at least. This year, though, it's still sort of, it's on the cards. We don't know when, so the show's been postponed. We're yet to see if that's actually going to happen. Hopefully it is. Prior to COVID, I've had one theatre show a year, which has been pretty good. From leaving yeah. university to getting straight into having work is not easy for a lot of actors. Do, have you managed to carve your own niche in the performing arts? So I would say that this niche or my target audience or the people that are gravitating towards my particular aesthetic or what I like to share is emerging, it's growing, I'm getting a clearer sense of who responds to my work, who engages with it with a bit more depth or, you know, interested in the same kind of topics as me. I would say it started happening maybe around mid last year. And I think the turning point for me was when I performed and wrote my own play. And that for me was really an opening of a different portal to a whole new range of communities and circles that were gravitating to my work. Before that, I'd say I was a lot more seeing how I could serve the industry, see where I fit the ticky boxes. Seeing diversity is such a hot topic and I'm very much involved in the conversation and have also seen how I have had these advantages in certain spaces to get these opportunities because of my diversity. So I know that's something that's been helping me, but it's also in a way made me try to see how I could tailor myself to the industry. And as of late, I haven't been as dependent in terms of how the industry is sustaining my practice as well. And it's a lot more detached, I would say, the relationship we have right now. So writing your own play is something that immediately puts your story in front of the audience instead of playing somebody else's perspective. And how did you get to that point of being the writer? I know you write poetry and, and look at this. <laughs> this is your self-published work of poetry yeah. from 2012, which... Yeah, right before I moved. I've had a lot of joy reading. You can tell that you're being very authentic about who you are. Here's a stanza that I really enjoy. We are rich, opaque movements grasping boundaries and beautiful lines, sitting humbly on the roofs of our dreams, mumbling into the chimneys of our breath. Mm. <laughs> it's yeah, that was from Human, wasn't it? That's Human, yeah. I think that was one of my favourite poems of the whole anthology. And you can feel through the words that you're really searching for solidity in authenticity and it's part of your journey yeah I think I've I've always been very introspective but now I'm being more expressive about it so I think that authenticity whatever that essence is has always been there but I am constantly growing and evolving and but now I'm a bit more open with it to a lot more people to the audience who don't know this I've known Emina since she was just barely a few hours old. And we've worked together as teacher and student from kindergarten into primary school. I know the kind of background that you're from, and I also mm -hmm. know the sort of person that you are. You've got pressure to behave a certain way, to conform in a certain way because of your background, and your background is very unusual. <laughs> <laughs> And then you're, you're a free spirit too. 
it's balancing and juggling what needs to be in place for certain roles that you are and what needs to be given its freedom to express itself, which side of you is which. And from a very young age, you've had to learn to sort that out. <laughs> <laughs> do you, you want to explain more about that? Yeah, um, I'll give it a crack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how do we unpack this? For me, to kind of crystallize that tension, it is this balancing act between passion and duty. I mean, that's a very broad right. way of describing it. A lot of it has to do with cultural background and family background. You know, my late father being a, a Sufi sheikh had its limitations maybe for me in terms of like how I perceived it growing up in terms of freedom of expression. How do you balance the difference between what you're supposed to do with what you feel you are? There's duty, there's passion and like a free spirit that wants to express herself artistically. How do you do mm. that? And okay, you've got to explain your family background. It forms part of your journey. So your father was a Sufi sheikh and then your grandfather at the time you were born, he was the king of Malaysia. So you yeah. had a lot of formality and protocol that was part of your upbringing. And then you have on the other side of your family, you've got a lot of creativity, a lot of arts and there's photography, there's poetry, there's dance, there's theater, there's film all going on in, in the other side of your family as well. And you're part of both. How do you balance that? <laughs> at such a young uh, age I don't know if balance is is the the right word or, or how I sort of navigated those two worlds if you like but negotiation I think was something a bit more present growing up now I I even think negotiation sounds a little too much like compromise so I don't necessarily use that term but it was this sort of negotiation between who can I be and who am I supposed to be the real bridge or the way I could express myself in the most authentic way would be through art, through poetry. You know, a lot of the poems in, in that book undulate. I feel like I sometimes used metaphor and simile and symbolism to be more translucent. I guess that's the actual word I would use. It's going between this domain of transparency and completely hiding thoughts and feelings in the shadows. So I thought translucency was my way of doing it. Okay. This idea of veiling and concealing and revealing. And as I grew older, I was having more agency with that approach. That's how I'd put it. And there are some overlaps. It's not saying that because your father was a spiritual teacher that he wasn't creative. He was very creative. He was very into music. The whole thing is highly unusual and unique <laughs> and it does contain pressure. But I think what you've done is you've navigated through that and you've brought out the best of everything and you are who you are. You've always been an individual spirit. You've always been very strong that way. I'm very interested in the journey and the way forward mm -hmm. and what you want to do with it because it's something that you share with others through your poetry you do a spoken word which has a community audience so you just get up in the room and you get up on the microphone mm. and you do your spoken word what inspired you to do things like that to do poetry to get up there and tell a story <laughs> through spoken words it contains depth and yet it contains mm. humor how you express who you really are i'm assuming that you took on that role because that's what you needed. That was like a healing experience to be able to get your words out. Would you agree? Yeah, I would say a lot of it had to do with throat chakra healing. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it had to do with freedom of voice. It's one thing to write poetry, but to speak it for yourself. There's a joy in that. The immediacy of speaking the words and knowing that your energy is dancing with the energy of the people around you in a way that is so present. Present. So really, my desire with that spoken word in, in a live performance format is really to essentially connect with people's hearts in the moment.
moment. You know, I love how they've had these studies where they measure the heart rates of audience members and they see that there's a coherence. Everyone's connecting on that same frequency. And I'm realizing the power of sound and how it can really shift the space and also just connect with people on a more subconscious level as well. So that's like my biggest joy that I get from doing work like that. It's open mic, but I like to also call it open hearted work. And it's really allowing yourself to be vulnerable in that space. And I personally find it a lot more vulnerable to do that sort of work in my own sharings than getting on a stage and performing as a character. To be able to use that and bring it to people, you're helping to clear that stuck energy. Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the intention behind it very much it's to do with healing but not from a I'm fixing you or anything like that but just through inspiration and sharing of experiences apart from with chakras you work with crystals stones tell us about that I would say it's done very intuitively I would channel intentions around particular pieces of work with crystals that I use and you know I'd bring them to rehearsal sometimes or I'd have them by the side of my notebook as I'm working in a cafe or things like that Carnelian being one of my go-to stones when it comes to creative expression. I got this one from a Mind Body Spirit Festival in 2017. And that was really when I started writing my play Make Me a Huri and sort of germinating those ideas while I was doing a creative writing graduate diploma at the time. So this was really been with me throughout the whole process from it being a 10 page draft to opening night and being in my dressing rooms. It's had a real journey with me. And what I also like to do is I like to, when I charge my crystals, you know, during those full moon times, I used to charge my script as well, whatever draft it was, to keep that intention going of manifesting this to how, allow the how, script to come to life. How do you do that? If somebody was interested in learning how to do that, what would they do? They take a stone, let's say, okay, I've got a stone. And yeah. I've got a script, a draft of a script. What do I do with the stone and my script? For me, I I set the intention and allow the energies to just connect through that. Depending on the, the content sometimes, I'll have different stones associated to that content. What I like about the carnelian, it's very sacral chakra. So it's all about sensuality and, you know, that area being the seat of emotions. I thought that makes sense to have something that emulates the style of my writing And if I want my play to have more of a heart chakra feel, or I want to use it with the intention of connecting with the audience from an emotional heart space, then I will put heaps of rose quads around it. Or, you know, I will do things like that. It's however you want to work with those crystals. I like to do it as a ritual when I do have those full moon altars that I create and charge my crystals outside of my balcony because I always have my intentions of what I want to release in terms of the month, any kind of sucked energies and all that. And then I'll also have something like a script or a poem. I really want to get this pitch going. I'm just going to put the pitch there. Yeah, I really believe in the power of intention, how powerful that is when you want to call something out to the universe. I believe that the more poetry I give, the more poetry I receive back. I kind of see it from that lens. So if this stone is going to symbolize this and this connects with my writing here, then that makes sense to me. And that's just going to infuse it even if it's just energetically from one thought to another. That's sort of how I work. Sometimes, yeah, I'll write and I'll have Amazonite next to me because that's really good for freedom of expression with the voice. Sometimes I'll have that carnelian. And then if I'm going into the rehearsal room, sometimes I bring those crystals too. And when I was rehearsing for Hungry Ghost, the play I did with Melbourne Theatre Company in 20. 18, I had some crystals in my bra and sometimes I would have those embarrassing moments of we've gone into a bit of a run so we can't stop. We're in in like the first scene and then you'll just hear this little thunk and a crystal has just popped out of my bra onto the floor and I'm just like, ah, should have just left it on the table. So I will also use crystals when it comes to approaching different plays and different characters and like, what's that world? So with Hungry Ghosts, I was playing with the element of air a lot. So then I found stones that were associated with that and appetite was a big one. So I think that's the one that kept falling out of my bra. But yeah, that's how I'd work with them. Have you ever thought of conducting workshops on this? I feel it would be really interesting, but I need 
for my own validation purposes, honestly, I would probably need to do a certificate in crystal healing or something like that. I have, yeah, that tendency to feel like I'm still the student, not the teacher. And maybe a certification of that will just make me feel like I can do this. But yeah, I've really been interested in how can I share these quirky little rituals and ways I connect my spiritual approaches to life and practices with my art history as much as I can. And when I used to go to VCA, I would still work with Oracle cards and crystals and things like that, but I would never bring it into the rehearsal room. And now the fact that I went into Melbourne Theatre Company with all my crystals and I just arranged them around my script every day, that's a real growth in confidence and a strong sense of myself and what I actually need. How can I be servicing in the best way and how can I bring myself fully without hiding all those parts of me it's very much your Virgo nature isn't it <laughs> purity service heal and clear and clean and then service to others in a way that is beneficial to all yeah it's, it's coming out a lot more <laughs> I can sense it a lot more now so I use these archetype cards which they're by Carolyn Miss <laughs> <laughs> and I picked three cards just to see what to focus on in this interview today. Great. And what I got, the inner character is child divine. Mm. The innocence, purity and redemption suggests a special connection with the divine. Okay. And you've just been talking about that. Then for the outer <laughs> character, I got rescuer provides strength and support to others in crisis, acts out of love with no expectation of reward. Mm. For the aspiring character, I got father. Ha, huh, that's interesting. Which says talent for creating and supporting life, positive guiding light within a tribal unit. Wow, that resonates. But yeah, interesting how it's connected to father as well, because I do feel like my father had those traits. I've noticed how like some of your work has been inspired by the influence of your father. You wrote an entire performance of poetry on a story of you and your father, Stardust. Yes. Stardust was really, I'm going to keep using this word. I love using it. It was a crystallization of the experience I had when I lost him to an asthma attack. So really trying to express that grief that I was going through in the first few years after he passed. I call it Stardust because I really felt like when he passed away, the immediate image that came to mind was I felt robbed by the stars. And that is an image that's very potent for me in a number of ways. It wasn't just losing my father, but also it reminded me of the connotations I have around him as this Sufi spiritual leader, someone who was really in love with the mystery teachings of the cosmos and this devotion to the divine. And so I was really wanting to explore that relationship between heaven and earth. And that's a recurring theme in pretty much everything I do. But this tension or relationship between spirit and skin. I saw my father as a stardust boy. And that's a term I love to use in so many aspects of my life now. I use that in a way of describing him as someone that was really in love with looking up from my perspective, already wanting to ascend or be in the spirit realm. That poetry set was me wrestling with that thought, linking it to memories of when he was alive and when I felt trapped or limited in my expressions and also limited in terms of having a relationship with him because I felt like he was to be of service and he was to serve the collective and do things in the name of faith. I felt like I was the earthy daughter and he was the astral dad. And so there's some funny references, you know, even the chocolate he picks is Milky Way. Like obviously he's the stardust boy and things like that. It was really, how did I contend with his death? And how did I shift that grief to gratitude and to seeing the gifts of what he came here to do, which was to be of service, to invoke this spiritual journey within the people that he, I don't like the word preach, but preach to. So yeah, it was this play of the earthy and the ethereal. Does that make sense? Do you agree? <laughs> 
it makes absolute sense. I've been very lucky to have listened to a recording that his last sermon, hours before he left the earthy realm. But one thing that really stood out for me was that message that the mind is limited, but the heart is infinite with its love. I really feel like that encapsulates a lot of his teachings and what he stood for. And, you know, when he passed away, his followers dubbed him Sultan of the heart. I really connect with that. That sense of this heart-centered wisdom was something that my father embodied, whether I wanted to admit it or not when he was alive as, you know, his daughter. But that was something that really stood out and something that still stands out for me. It reminds me actually of this time when I was learning economics in Garden International School and I was just getting excited about it. And for Father's Day, I actually gifted him a diagram. <laughs> and it was, it was based on the price elasticities, but it was basically to do with price and the quantity of demand or something and how responsive it is to that change in price. But what I did was the elasticity of love and so I put the scale as age and love. And it was like, no matter how old he is, the love is a vertical line. It's infinite. And so when he passed away and I heard that sermon for me, that just connected immediately to that diagram that I gave him when I was 14, 15. Just no matter how old, how much time passes, the love is infinite. And I really feel like that reflects what he said on his final night. So there's a connection there. <laughs> There's a very big connection there, yeah. I can see how you've been influenced by both your parents and your mum as well. I mean, when we work together in the SKBD Drama Club, you can tell that your mum has her inner child intact, that she never let go <laughs> of. She sees the world through the innocence of children's eyes and connects with children so well. And she's worked with children all her life, as well as being an artist in her own right. When we worked on the, the making of teeth, a performance for children to bring awareness of saving the sharks, she would come up with the most zany things. And I'd, I was like, yes, put them on rollerblades so they can swim across the stage. Yes, do it. You know, <laughs> so this kid wants to be an anchovy. Can we do it? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> She'd put together so much. She'd spend hours drawing, making lists, writing ideas, creating t-shirts. And I'd sit there carving a story out with you guys. Then we'd sit after school and figure out what are the characters and what kind of story. And it would never be boring. In that show, you opened with a huge monologue. Oh, wow, I don't even remember the monologue. <laughs> 12 year old, a 12 year old opening as a mermaid, sitting on a rock, flipping a coin and saying heads or tails. We worked out this monologue and you said heads or tails, come on, heads or tails. Ha, huh, I win, you lose. A head <laughs> and a tail, a head and a tail, two different sides of the same coin, two different sides of the same story. Nobody's actually right and nobody's wrong. Well, not entirely. It just depends which side of the same story you're hearing. I've heard both and whatever you have heard already, like sharks are bad, sharks are dangerous, sharks eat people. I am going to ask that you reserve your judgment. Take a look at the other side. And it goes on and you <laughs> delivered this character on the side. Mm. Whereas all this like kids on rollerblades were going on. And I thought, no, you did such a remarkable job for a 12 year old. It was very professional. And I could oh. see from that moment on that you could be a really good actress when the spotlight is on you and you slow time down in your space by being in the moment that you can hold that space and deliver without feeling pressured. I saw that in you and I thought, this girl's gonna go on her journey. And you did. What do you do to get into character? How do you extract the essence of the character and portray that with as much integrity as you do? Okay. So I have a different approach to every character that I play, but something that keeps sticking in terms of what I like to do is sensorial exploration and linking that with images that 
arise from reading the script. So I do a lot of script analysis to understand what the script is telling me, the information around it, the background, all the factual things. I do that. But then I also like to look at it from a very poetic lens. Like what is the element that we're playing with here? Is this an airy script? Is this an earthy character? I love that investigation. An example would be when I was playing a character called Lama in Tales of a City by the Sea, where I played a refugee in, in Gaza. One of the monologues she had was talking about how she was making these sandwiches when the bombs were going off. I love that sort of tactile exploration. So I told my director when we were sort of just playing with images and ideas in a space in a very abstract way, can I get a hold of the zangta, which is the... The spice. The spice, yeah. Can, yeah. can I get a hold of it? I just want to hold it. I want to smell it. And she was like, yep, great. I love this approach. And we went down to the Arab shop down the road and we got a whole packet of it. And I just put my hands in it. I smelt it and it had this really earthy quality to it. I really felt with that character, the element that I was playing with was earth. I mean, this was a woman that became pregnant towards the end of the play and she really wanted to give birth as a way of showing that idea of beautiful resistance and that we're still alive and we're still thriving. Things like that, like this Zatar spice, as well as finding the element of the character. Like what does she stand for? She stands for birth, she stands for rebirth, she stands for being really grounded in her sense of home. You know, all these sort of anchoring traits. I was like, how, how many ways can I bring this exploration into the portrayal of my character? So things would be, yeah, I would make these sandwiches before we started the shows every night. I would always doodle roses and flowers around my script. I would do things like that. I would get onto Pinterest boards because I'm very visually stimulated. And I found this incredible photo of a woman who basically turned all all these old bombshells into pot plants in Gaza. And for me, that was like an image that just stuck. Like for me, that's Lama. She's allowing for things to bloom in this space. And so Hungry Ghosts, for instance, you know, that was a very different approach. It was a lot closer to home because we were looking at issues in Malaysia, be it politics or cultural identity or anything like that. <laughs> Something I did was I ate a lot of spicy food because I felt like with my character, she had the really biting one-liners and remarks. She was quite sharp. So I would do things like I eat spicy food because I felt like my character was quite pedas. How can I bring the sambal into the script by just my presence so I could eat it? Or I could find a whole bunch of adjectives in Malay that have nothing to do with a play, but just all these words that kind of incite that, whether it's just, you know, from a like an oral way. But I would just use these words like pedas and rumpa and like, and that play was so poetic as well. I mean, if you ever get a chance to read it, I think you can find it online. It's called Hungry Ghosts and it's by um, Jean Tong, who's an amazing Malaysian playwright in, um, in Melbourne. And the writing is just so sharp and poetic and funny and really cerebral, but very rhythmic too. And so I was like, I'm going to explore all these Malay words, even though they have nothing to do with the script, but I just want to get that rhythm. I want to get that punch in my character. So that's another approach I'd use. Sometimes I dance my way into a character. There was another play where I played this woman, well, she was a teenager prone to abuse from her older brother. And she almost drowned when she was really young and things like this, but there was always this association of water. So then I would always listen to songs that felt murky. And so then I play in that realm and like, how can I bring out those dark elements of this character? And so, yeah, elements is a huge thing for me. Was that, was that Bob Kills Her Father? Oh, yes. and it, I was very intrigued by that because very opposite, very different to um, Tales of the City by the Sea, which which I saw when it toured in Malaysia. And I, that was a very, very moving story with, from a real perspective of someone who's been there. And you brought out this character of the Palestinian. It's so well, it's so believable. It's so moving, so gut-wrenching, so the simplicity of it. Yet it's like all the years of complications. And then your hungry ghost. Wasn't that 
at the time when you were trying to purge spiritually and go on a, a spiritual purging where you wanted to... <laughs> so, you. Yeah, you must have heard that in one of my poetry sets that I did where I wrote a poem in response to this tension that I was feeling as I was rehearsing and performing this play called Hungry Ghosts. So from what I know anyway, Hungry Ghosts is very much alluded to that Buddhist culture and mythology about these restless spirits that are trapped in cycles and not attaining enlightenment, but being stuck in that limbo. So really trying to explore that liminal space was something that was really important that sustained and kept that world alive because there was no real setting. And as I was doing that in the rehearsal room, I was working very intensely with a shaman of mine. And in that stage we were really looking at where I was right now in the sense of I really I think we both intuitively felt like I was transiting into a new cycle a new space and from the time my father passed away to this period which was early 2018 there was a lot of darkness there was a lot of shadow work there was that descent And with that descent came all these karmic lessons. So looking at it from the perspective of karma and karmic partners and soul ties and soul contracts, what I was trying to do is clear, cut cords, make peace with that time to allow for the new to come in. So while I'm every night playing this restless spirit, that's also very much talking about things like politics and corruption and death, these intense feelings. There was also like a wrath to my character as well. At the same time, I'm doing all these meditations to clear myself. All that stuff out of you. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if this is, I wouldn't say it's counterproductive, but it was a very interesting contrast to go from, all right, I'm in this space of attracting negative energy. And some of my friends were actually like, you're in this role, you're in this world. Are you afraid? What if you attract that energy? Like the superstitious side of it came out very strongly and within me as well. So I made sure that I meditated almost every night, ground myself and protect myself in a way and remember that this is play. And as a human being, I try to separate myself in some ways. I want to really let go of this heaviness and this darkness. And that's me in service to what other people could resonate with. And here I am working on my own evolution to see what comes next. It was a very beautiful contrasting time and very much in that space of air and earth and darkness and lightness. So it just brought up all these things. It was just like a Pandora's box for even more introspection. It was interesting going between purging and projecting this place of not wanting to to move forward. We find that as an actress, that the universe does deliver you a Pandora's box each and every time you do a production. It's the right one. Yeah, it's like, right, this is what I need to work with, obviously, yeah. (laughs) So tell us about your play, Make Me a Hoori, which, by the way, is available online for sale, which you can (laughs) buy. We'll put the link below so that you can purchase that play. It's fascinating. Fascinating build up to it, fascinating pictures from what I can see. Tell us about that experience. In a nutshell, it's a play set in the afterlife and it's this interaction between two women, Asmara and Safiya. And Asmara is a woman who wants to become a Huri, which can be transliterated as an Islamic virgin of paradise, according to certain scriptures. And she wants to become this Huri to be able to get into heaven and be with her long lost late lover. She tries to take on these steps or these principles that Huri supposedly have while she's facing these memories that have been inspired by the conversation that she has with Sophia, which are mainly in regards to her own lived embodied experiences as a woman on earth. So it really is in this sort of mythical, ethereal realm. And the provocation is really around spirituality and sensuality and purity and morality and things like that. That's kind of like the crux of the story is 
a lot of different audience members go, I love how it's really non-judgmental. They liked its approach. It wasn't clear cut. There was no right or wrong. It wasn't black and white. And that was completely the point of it as well, to really interrogate these moral contradictions and these paradoxes in my Islamic cultural upbringing. And so really playing on the mind and the body and spirit and skin and ideology and lived experience. And it was my way of questioning, can I actually shift the paradigm of my own paradise? Because for a long period of time, I felt a misalignment with what I believe, what I'm told to believe, and what is true. And so that play was a real invitation for me to go deeper and deeper into my own desires and my own beliefs. So it's a real descent, but it's also quite contemporary. The language is quite contemporary. The references are quite contemporary as well. Yeah, I hope I've done it justice. <laughs> That's kind of what it's about. And I really feel like I've had this sort of mind, body, soul connection and investigation with it. Because how can someone's here and hereafter be another person's golden moment in time? And what are the motivations for reaching this afterlife? And what does that look like? So at that point, the battery <laughs> died. We ended up pulling up a chart for Make Me a Huri's first performance. And it's a very interesting chart. Uranus is the ruler of the chart because the ascendant is in Aquarius. And Uranus is directly on the fourth house cusp of home, mothers, parents. And that's tightly conjunct the moon, the emotions, the feelings. And as Uranus is unique in perspective and the moon and Uranus together combine, create electricity in emotion. Juno, the asteroid that represents love and marriage. On the descendant, which is relationships, but conjunct Mars, an antagonistic feeling of I'm angry about this. Vesta, right in the fourth house of home and hearth and Vesta's purity in his in eternal virgin <laughs> that's perfect <laughs> it's amazing how the chart actually represents the play that you've written Chiron in the third house of communication Chiron mm. is the wounded healer who needs to heal the wound of being able to talk about the taboo wow Ooh. And Chiron is in a very nice trine with the sun, the creative expression in Leo, the sign that represents drama and theater. Mercury is retrograde, but it's tightly conjunct Venus in the sixth house in Cancer. And this is what the moon rules. The chart ruler conjunct the moon, the moon ruling Venus and Mercury Mercury retrograde, talking about the past through creative expression in the sixth house of work and routine and, <laughs> and in the sign of cancer. Neptune in the second house of sacrificing this world, sacrificing the body. <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter. Very on point. <laughs> Jupiter of religion in Sagittarius where it rules philosophical which is religion as well which is beliefs in the 11th house of society exactly trying Mars and Juno on the descendant so this is showing the way forward and out of this paradigm is to expand the philosophy of society. Pluto's in the 12th house of the psyche. <laughs> the underworld is inside the psyche. Does that summarize what the play was about? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Could we get some sort of like sound bite of what to expect? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Okay, so this is from scene 14 which I called ablution. I think it had to do with his blue bedroom walls and the nuzzle of his air conditioner muttering to me, you're safe here. The doomsday waves were near. His shower is a muggy veil, screening me off from all warning signs. We turn the silver handles and his sliver shields my skin as 30 video links to the apocalypse splash into my inbox. Football sweat tranquilizes my quaking lips as Fukushima's radiation patters down and stains my school notebook now tremoring with case studies. The numbers were surging. 
so I sprayed away the statistics with his sports deodorant. I slip into his bunk bed for shelter as I linger in his black shorts with damp hair on his doona, smelling of his family's washing powder. There was nothing spacey about him. He lived on a street called Dewdrop, but the waves were coming. The Antichrist has already dug his way up from the mantle and currently swims in the Indian Ocean. Recite these prayers or no one will be spared. What about him? He let me use his shower. Wow. Yeah, that's a special one. Yeah. A lot of my play deals with eschatology, so the concept of afterlife. And one thing that haunted me and really affected my psyche growing up were these prophecies around 2012 and Armageddon. So that poem is a little bit of a symbol of how I found comfort and peace and tranquility through a high school sweetheart that for me represented things that were material and, you know, to do with human connection, something a bit more grounding. So do you have another poem? I want to hear more. I have a gazillion journals and I tend to write in them when I'm rehearsing and things like that. So this one was the one I used for Make Me A Hoori. So I did a lot of Make Me A Hoori writing in here. So there's rehearsal notes. There's a little song that came out one night when I was just, I guess, taking a break from rehearsing and then a song wanted to come through. And I imagined it was in the form of my character, Asmara, talking to me and giving me like guidance on how to play her. So I have all sorts of things, but I like this. So I'm going to read this. This was just from a stream of consciousness writing right before the play. Cool. So a little bit of my psyche. I think it was a week out. So it was on the 19th of July and we opened on the 25th. So I'll read a little bit of this. I sit in the botanical gardens, listening to the Avatar soundtrack. I have some of the props from Make Me A Hoori in a silver bucket beside me. I feel sinewy lavender. I feel blades of grass, winter trees, and a band-aid heart. This is a culmination. This is unbelievable catharsis. I'm a fire bird with feathers feeling air. My heart is so bare, so, so bare. And through the curtain drapes, I go naked, surrender and release, surrender and release, surrender and release. I sit still, only the lily chambers breathe. They remind me of the mud and the soil and the deep muck. This moment of serenity is gorgeous. It's perfect. It is soul perfect. Let the tears come. Your heart has held so much. Next week, you shift the paradigms of your paradise. Your expressions align with your embodiment. Allow your soul and skin to be one, for they are. I, I like this because I feel like it connects to me as a 12-year-old mermaid on stage. So I wrote this. <laughs> this mermaid, this woman, Asmara, says thank you for passionately helping her sing. Sing her darkness, sing her depth, her despair, her deflections, unraveled, unearthed undressed you have revealed with barely any judgment you have transmuted her trauma into treasure and she has turned jewel she is becoming she is beauty and now you have taken on her wisdom and made it your truth gosh <laughs> i can feel where it's coming from because this is your first full length play you're a week away and you've put in all this work but that feeling of wanting to contract and expand at the same time is in there you want to go forward but that feeling of retracting back because this is putting it all out there and the fiery bird yeah the mermaid that reminds me i knew i had this somewhere the date is march 2003 oh wow there's you and me. Yeah. <laughs> In Fauzi and Aoi's production of Tot Rimao, we're singing there, I'm Jin Taiyu and you're a princess. Yeah, I love oh, that. Here's to three more cards. This is mm -hmm. your inner self, virgin. <laughs> <laughs> so it's maintaining symbolic purity of heart and spirit goddess <laughs> but outwardly feminine expressed through wisdom nature life force and sensuality oh wow that's really juicy 
I like that a lot. Duality, there you go. (laughs) I'm so curious. Two came out together. (laughs) Okay. So, and they're very contradictory. Child nature, friendships with animals, communication with nature spirit. Ah, fairies. (laughs) Femme fatale. Oh, wow. (laughs) Highlights the erotic energy of the feminine, opens your heart when your dependency is rejected. That really spoke to me. (laughs) Such a lovely reading. (laughs) Where can we find you? How can we follow your work? (laughs) Do you have a website? Yep, I have a website, aminaashman.com. I would love if you did resonate with any of the material, if you just wanted to shoot a contact us, I'd love to know if it connected with you in any way. And I have an Instagram account. I'm posting a lot of the time there. It very much captures a lot of my process. If you're a casting director and you're hiring someone in Melbourne and you're interested, I have agents, active artists management. If you just type that in and my name, it should come up. They're really supportive of my independent work as well. But I am hoping to start a Patreon account so I can embrace more of that monetary exchange, allowing to create a space to generate work for people that are interested in what I have to offer. Because I do feel like my writing influences my acting and the roles that come to me, influences my poetry. And something that's a bit present right now is singing. So I'm really going to see how that comes into my field a bit more some people have shown a little bit of interest in wanting to collaborate with me so I'm going to keep that aspiration alive and see how the poetry interweaves with it it feels like a really potent time for collaborating with like-minded creatives that are interested in spirituality as well and can go deep with me (laughs) Emina Ashman (laughs) thank you Say bye-bye to everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening. Remember to like, share and subscribe to Mowan Drama for the choiciest, tastiest, most wholesome drama around.